So I don't want to give you a theoretical speech about purpose today. Actually, I want to share my personal journey with you and, and purpose. That's why the title of this uh, speech is The Power of Purpose, plays a vital role in that, in that journey. And I want to start at the beginning of my professional career. So my first company I started in 2002. The company's name was Ubitex, and we made a software for mobile devices. The reason why I started this company was I was totally driven, driven by technology. I really loved technology. I was totally excited about this mobile device area. That was actually even pre-smartphone. So some of you are probably too young to even remember that. Um, I was ambitious. I wanted to create something really big. Uh, I also wanted to become famous and become rich. Actually, that was also part of the reason to start uh, a company. And I also wanted to show my dad, who was also a successful businessman, that I can also do it. And you know, we grew the company from 2002 onwards. We took on venture capital. We went to the US, uh, built a US subsidiary. We also went through really tough times in 2008 and 2009. The financial crisis hit the market back then, and we, would be almost, we were almost bankrupt at that time. Shortly after that, one of my co-founders stole half a million from the company, so we had to get him out in a lawsuit. You can imagine that was a huge and really painful thing. Um, I was exhausted and stressed quite often, I have to say, but I wanted the success so much uh, and I really believed in the success uh, that I kept pushing. And I guess this is part of a lot of entrepreneurial journeys very often. Eventually the company was successful. We sold it to BlackBerry in 2011 and the whole team then joined this large company. At that time, BlackBerry had 20,000 employees. And my first task was to integrate Ubitax into BlackBerry. Uh, I had to evangelize internally to make sure everybody understands what we do and that they are, you know, feel good to sell it. And I learned a lot because I had to learn how to move around in such a corporate environment because I'd never worked in a corporation that big before. And I learned it's actually a lot less stress than being an entrepreneur. Uh, that's one thing, but it's also a lot less responsibility and a lot less opportunity to influence. So I was looking for more ways you know, to influence and to make decisions. And then one day I was offered the position of becoming the managing director for Germany, which I took, which obviously was more responsibility. At that time, we had about 500 people in Germany and the, the CEO of the company was actually German at that time. So there was a lot of focus on the German market. But over time, I found out that actually it's still, although you know, that position, I was, had still had very little influence in what we did with the business, I really felt like being an executor, right? Decisions were made somewhere else. I was just executing those ideas. And then one year later, there was a new CEO coming on board to BlackBerry, the guy who still runs the company. And he approached me and he said, you know what? I wanna turn around the company. I wanna move the company from a hardware business, which they had at that time, to a software business. I need people with entrepreneurial spirit because that's a huge effort, huge change project. I also need people with software experience. So why don't you take over Europe? And Europe at that time was the largest region, region by far with around 4,000 people. We had 1 billion in revenue, $1 billion in revenue. The headquarter was in London. And I, I, again, I took the job and I said, you know, maybe now I'm in a position just right below the board to make decisions and to influence what's happening. But you can imagine the answer was the same, actually. I found out even in that position, there was actually very little I could do. So what I learned about myself in that period is that I really like to make decisions. I also need to feel that I can contribute to a business. And I want to influence what we do and how we do things. And I guess this is what makes an entrepreneur. So at that time, I knew you know, I'm probably more an entrepreneur than a corporate guy. But there was more that bothered me at that time and made me really unhappy. And it was really difficult for people from the outside to understand because everybody who looked at me from the outside, all my friends and family and everybody said, you know, this is, you have an amazing life. You're successful. You know, you travel a lot. You travel in private planes. You stay at awesome hotels. You meet famous people. So there was a lot of recognition and approval from my friends and family and from everybody. And at some point you even think, you know, if everybody says this life is amazing, it must be. But in this case, I asked myself and my answer was, no, it's not. It's not the life I want to live because what I was missing was a social life. 
You know, I traveled five days a week. I was literally in the plane every day of the week. I had no chance to play cards with my friends, which I love to do. You know, I couldn't play team sport. Uh, I was just in a lonely gym in one of the random hotels I stayed in in Europe. And honestly, to cover up for those missing social elements in my life, I started to drink more wine. Uh, I also started to eat more, which at some point, uh, I guess you could see from the outside. And I also started buying expensive stuff, which I didn't need. Uh, just one example, I remember being in London one day in our headquarters, and it was a frustrating day. And I went to this watch store and I bought this expensive watch. And the lady who sold it to me said, oh, you know, this must be a special occasion. You know, it's probably something special today because you're buying this expensive watch. And I thought to myself, no, I'm just frustrated. That's all, right? And I also noticed one other thing which I didn't know I had before, honestly, because my exposed position in BlackBerry and all the recognition you know, we receive um, changes you. It changed me at least. And I just want to give you an example because I had a driver in London who drove me around, a chauffeur who drove me around to meetings and to the airport and so on. And I remember one day he picked me up at the headquarter to drive me to Heathrow Airport to fly back to, to Munich. And he didn't open the door for me. And I went inside, I had to do it myself. I sat in the back seat and I was pissed. And like one split second later, I thought, you know, shit, like what person did I become to be pissed because a chauffeur didn't open the fucking door for you? You know, this was really bothering me. And I have to tell you that, you know, success and all this recognition from the outside is a little bit like honey. The more you get, the more you want. And it's sweet and you get addicted to it and it changes you. And I didn't, I knew I didn't want to become such a person who needs recognition to feel good, who defines himself through a position in a company only, through a position in a company or mainly, or who uses alcohol, food, or watches as a replacement for social interactions with friends. And then I remember this one day when I was at one random airport, I don't recall which one it was, I had to wait, I kill a little bit of time, wait for my flight to depart. And I was in this bookstore at the airport and I saw a book and the title of the book was The Top Five Regrets of Dying by Bronnie Ware. And she is a nurse and she interviewed a thousand people on a deathbed. And she asked them, if you could live your life again, what would you do differently? What would you change? And she created the top five answers out of, out of that and then wrote a book about it. And I only remember the top three, honestly. And those top three I want to share with you because they had a big um, impact on me. The first one was, I wish I would have had the courage to live a life true to myself, not what others expect me to. Second was, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. And the third was, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And I flew back to Munich and the same night I wrote my resignation. Because I knew that when I continue my life like I had it, I will regret the exact same things in my life, right? So I had to change something, I had to leave. And one week later, I was put on garden leave and I went to Thailand the same night actually uh, to a friend. He lives in the northern part of Thailand, a very small and quiet um, little village. And I detoxed from this adrenaline level, which was so high that it took me almost six weeks to get to a healthy stress level, I would say. And that now, and, and then actually I moved on to South Africa, I went down to South America, so I traveled a lot. But at some point I asked myself a question, what's next? You know, I didn't know what was next because I quit my job because I knew I had to escape this world which didn't make me happy. But I didn't know what would make me happy. And I also didn't know what I wanted to do. And that was a very interesting uh, life experience. That was the first time in my life that I did not have any goals. Like I always had goals, you know, it was the A-level initially, and then it was, you know, getting through university, and then it was starting the company and making it successful, selling it, you know, being successful in BlackBerry and so on. I always had goals and I always worked towards them. And when I achieved them, I checked, I had a check mark, and then I moved on to the next one. But all of a sudden, there was no goal anymore. And there's an interesting, a funny story, because I was at an event at a party, I think it was. And there was this random guy sitting next to me and we started talking and then he started bringing up this topic of, you know, hey, you know what, I'm really in a difficult position right now because in my life, all of a sudden, I have no goals anymore. I don't know what to do. It never happened to me before. And it really feels bad. And without even thinking, I started answering to him 
And during that answer, I noticed that I'm answering my own life question at that point. And what I told him was, you know, maybe it's an interesting experience uh, if you don't have a goal, because when you have a goal, then you are very narrow minded. You, know, you have a very narrow view because you have you're targeting this goal. You know, you need to be very focused and, and very sm small, small viewed. Right. But when you don't have a goal anymore, then you open up like your view opens up and maybe you see things which you wouldn't have seen before because, you know, on the side, on the left or the right side, there are people or things or topics which come up where you see, wow, you know, this is amazing. I could have never seen that with, with a goal. And that happened to me, actually, because I read an article about a voluntary hospice worker. Uh, that's a person who accompanies people in their dying process. And I read this article, it was a one-page article, and the guy explained what he does and why he does it. And it touched me so much that I started crying after it. And that was that's very unusual for me. That usually doesn't happen. And I didn't know why, because I didn't have anybody dying in my family or, you know, my parents are still alive now. So I didn't know why. I just knew if there is a resonance, if there is a connection, I need to explore this topic further. And I did that, and I found out that there's actually a training you can take. 10 months training in Munich to become a voluntary hospice worker. And there are two things I learned in that training, which I want to share with you. Number one has to do with the fact that I'm an entrepreneur by heart. All right. And as an entrepreneur, you always take on challenges. And when there is a challenge, you look for different possible solutions. You discuss them maybe, and then you make a decision for one of them and then you execute. Right. And hopefully it solves the challenge. If not, then maybe you take on uh, the second, uh, another solution, another option. The problem with this is, in this case, is that for death, there's no solution, right? And there's no, you cannot change it. It's inevitable for all of us, right? So what I learned in this course and also by, you know, being with those people is that um, I can't give them a solution and I don't have to give them a solution because there is no solution for this. What I can give them is my presence. And this was a huge learning for me to understand that being present is a quality itself. I was so used to always being active and always do something that I didn't know that if you're present and you're there and you're listening, and if I say you're there, it, I don't just mean physically there. I'm also meaning mentally there. You know, it's almost like a meditation. You're really present in that moment. That really helps people. And I don't have to say anything. I don't have to answer any questions they might have. I don't have to give them options. I just, I'm just there. And that is enough to help them through that difficult time. And the second thing I learned is that we are all mortal. Like we are, our life is finite. And this is something we forget quite often. Because what happens when you know that you're not living infinite is that it creates more value for the remaining time. And you think more about like, what do I want to do with this time? We had an interesting exercise in that 10 months course. And that was a meditation we did where we imagined ourselves in a situation where we knew we only had to live one year from today. So I'm dying in one year from now. Or another, uh, then we all changed that to one month, one week, or one day. And the question was always, would you, what would you do if you knew you only have to live one more year? Would you change anything? And if the answer was, yes, I would change a lot, then the other question was, like, why don't you do it then? Why don't you change it now? Because none of us know whether we live for another year. May hopefully we live for another 50 or 80 years, but we don't know. We just know at some point it's over. And what that makes is it start, starts, you start thinking, what is important to you? What are your priorities in life? When you know you only have to live one year, you'd rather want to spend it, you know, in a good way. You want to, you know, live those values you might have. And you want to, you know, prioritize things. You just don't live every day as, it, you know, you live every day as it, it was your last day, really. And that's an important question to, to ask yourself, what do you really want in life? And my experience is that most people are afraid of, of asking that question because they know if they're really honest, honest with the answers, they have to change something in their life. And change is always uh, connected to fear because you don't know what's happening, you know? So, and in that period, uh, I re read a book called The Big Five for Life by John Strelacki. By the way, that's a great management book as well. So if you're an entrepreneur and you want to lead people and you want to build your company, read it. It's really good. And one exercise he was suggesting is that you imagine yourself on your deathbed when you're 90 years old, right? So you're 90 years, you had a great long life. 
you're 90 years old, you know now you have to go and you look back to your life. Like five, find, find five qualities or five things in your life, which if they had happened, if you lift those in your life, you can easily go, right? You, can, you, you don't have to hold on to your life. You can say, now I'm, I lift all those things. Everything that was important to me, I lift, I can go now. And I wrote down those five things. It took me almost a year to really get to a point where I said, this is now what I really want in my life. And I used those five things as a compass in my life. It's like whenever I saw a new opportunity, I looked at my compass and I said, you know, does it fit to one of those five things? If it doesn't, most likely I'm not proceeding. If it does, I at least want to, you know, check it better, understand it better, and then make a decision whether I pursue it or not. And those five things, I want to share those with you in my case are number one, I want to travel. I want to see other cultures, meet other people. I want to be inspired by other countries and by other cultures. Number two for me is the hospice work, right? The work where I work with people who are in the death process and who are dying. Number three, I want to be an entrepreneur because that's who I am. That's my nature. And that's uh, which makes me happy. Number four is love. And uh, that's probably, if you have to nail it down to one most important thing in life, that's probably the most important one, you know, to love and be loved. And I'm not talking about partner love only, I'm talking about love in general. And the fifth goal for me is that I want to explore how people can live in communities. Because I don't think that we are made to, to live, you know, single life in a small apartment in a large city. I think we are people who, who strive in communities. So those for me are the five things I want to live in my life. And you see that none of those five things I can ever complete. It's not that there's a checkbox and I say I want a house uh, at the beach, you know, because that's something you can achieve. And then you have a checkbox and that's it. But I'd rather try to live those five qualities, I should say, and give them space in my life. So I could also explain it with a cake. Like it's like a cake and that cake is my life. And this cake has five pieces. You know, some of them are smaller, some of them are bigger. Maybe that changes over time. You know, in some periods, one of those pieces might be very big and the others might be smaller. I'm just trying to take a look at my cake from time to time and see if I'm at least, you know, giving every of those five qualities some space. That's why I don't like this um, when people talk about work-life balance, because for me, life and work is not different, right? It's one thing. I mean, it's one life you have. And in that life, work plays a role, right? It's one piece of the cake or maybe two pieces of the cake, but it's not different. It's the same thing. So that's something I, I did at that time and that I found that quite helpful. And it took me actually quite a time to find a field to live my entrepreneurial side, which as, as I told you is one of the cake's pieces. Until I met Chris, my co-founder with Nui Care now. So and he spoke about his parents who need care now. And he said that there is actually no digital support for him as a family caregiver. And when he told me that, that 100% resonated with my experience as a hospice worker, because I saw those family caregivers and I saw how they struggled at home. I saw how difficult it is for them to get the right information at the right time, you know, to even understand how, how care works, because in a lot of cases that happens overnight. You know, your mother has a stroke and then tomorrow you are a family caregiver. And I was excited. I was totally excited about it. And I also thought, you know, I could use my software experience as well as my hospice experience. So we started Nui Care in the beginning of 2019 to help family caregivers with a digital companion. So Nui is now one piece of my cake. Right now, it's actually a quite large one because, you know, when you start a new company, it needs a lot of energy. I also try to lift the other pieces. And the interesting experience, and I never had that before actually, is that the experience that those pieces can overlap. You know, it, hospice doesn't need to be separated from my work, obviously, right? But neither does love, for example. Again, not with a partner, but with people in general. You, know, you, can, you can interconnect those pieces together and you can try to live them as integrated as possible. And actually living your purpose is quite selfish because it's scientifically proven to, that it makes you happy. And that's okay, because only if you are okay and if you are happy, you can you know, do that stuff in the long run. You can um, contribute in the long run and nothing else is sustainable. And also maybe your purpose is not that one thing, but maybe it's five things like in my case, right? 
because I found it really difficult if you looking for this one thing, you know, this one purpose in your life that puts a lot of pressure on you. Maybe you start with one or two things and then you add more over time. That's what happened to me. Like it took me a year, as I said, to find those five things. But the main question you need to ask yourself is what makes you happy in your life and how can you live that even if you would die tomorrow? Thank you. Thank you.